Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Dante Fortson here with Daniel the Prophet and the Birth of Christ, the Origin of the Magi. So today's study is a little bit off the beaten path. Um, it's kind of going to intersect history and belief systems and really dive into some of the stuff that's probably outside of your scope of reference, um, mostly because it's not encouraged to be studied in most churches. Um, and when you come out of the church, unless it's something you just happen to look into, it's probably something you won't even end up looking at. So I do want to cover some of that stuff today. Uh, we're going to talk about the origin of the Magi. Where did they come from? Who were they? Why were they in the field? Why did the angel appear to them? Why were they looking for the Messiah? And we'll answer some uh, a bunch of questions uh, that go along goes with along with that. So if you have not subscribed to my channel yet, make sure you hit the subscribe button, make sure you hit the thumbs up and like this video. And most importantly, make sure you click the notification bell so you don't miss whenever I post new videos. And today's study is brought to you by undeniable full color evidence of black Israelites in the Bible. If you want proof of what you believe and you don't want to debate people, show them the hard evidence and this book is full of the hard evidence not scripture interpretation not history not anything just straight evidence and if you want the history you want an understanding about who we are where we come from where we're going the black hebrew awakening the final 400 years as slaves in america that book is exactly what you need if you want to get caught up to where we are now uh, both of these are available on amazon.com and barnesandnoble.com if you want to support, go to patreon.com forward slash Dante Fortson. If you would like to support via Cash App, go to uh, cash tag B-H-I-T-B. I also have PayPal. And for those of you watching live, if you want to support, uh, click the dollar sign and you can support directly in the super chat. If you do not have it to support, a share and a prayer are always appreciated. And finally, Ultimate Bible Companions. Lined and dotted notebooks uh, for those that like to take Bible study notes. The books come with weights, measures, times, links, and maps that you probably don't have in your study Bible. These are also available at Amazon and Barnes and Noble. If you want a free book, you can go to BlackHistoryInTheBible.com. Uh, you can get the free PDF of pre-slavery Christianity. It was never the white man's religion. All you have to do is go to BlackHistoryInTheBible.com, enter your email address, check your email click the confirmation link click the download link and enjoy you will get a free pdf copy of the book if you follow those instructions all right so let me start off with a bible verse <coughs> excuse me i'm getting over a cold so uh bear with me please so through desire a man having separated himself seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom proverbs 18 1. Uh, when I was younger, this is one of the verses that uh, fascinated me. I became obsessed with this verse, like really trying to understand what it meant. And I didn't get it until I backed away from the traditional church setting and I started to really explore the Bible on my own and research. And the this is one of the, today's study is one of the things I ran into in the midst of my research and I went back and I brushed up on it and said, you know what, let me present these findings and see what everybody else thinks. So I'm going to issue a disclaimer with today's uh, research. The disclaimer is use your best judgment. It's not pertinent to salvation at all whatsoever. It's just an interesting historical, I want to say anomaly, uh, but it does this type of thing comes up a lot, so I guess it's not so much as an anomaly as an as an interesting study. So let's talk about the birth of Christ. Um, usually we hear of three wise men coming because of the, the um, gifts, gold, frankincense and myrrh. What we're not going to get into today, we're not going to get into um, the specifics of Christ's birth, but we're going to talk more so about the the wise men that came to visit Christ and we will go through history and try to figure out who these wise men were, what they believed, where they were from, why they were even looking for Christ in the first place and why the angel chose to appear to them. So let's start in the book of Matthew. Uh, we're going to read from two different gospels, Matthew and I believe John. Let me make sure. No, Luke, Matthew and Luke. We're going to come back to John later. So 
Uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So right there, we see that something is off. These are wise men that came from the east to Jerusalem. And notice how they refer to him. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? They were not Jews. And we're going to dig further into that. Uh, verse 3. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And to understand what was going on, Rome was in power. Herod was uh, put in place. He was the Edomite. And he was put in place over Jerusalem. And the king of the Jews should have been ruling in Jerusalem. They were all familiar with this uh, prophecy of the Messiah. So we're going we're gonna to see Herod's reaction, which is crazy. But, uh, well, we're not going to see that today because we're not going to get into that. Uh, but basically, Herod's reaction is to have every child, uh, every male child under the uh, two and under murdered. So Christ is going to end up getting sent to Egypt after these events. So verse three, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. So he didn't doubt that Christ is being born. He just wanted to know where so he could kill him. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah art not the least among the princes of Judah for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. That's from the book of Micah. We're going to come back to that. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men or privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. So they have questions. There's a sign. There's a star, a specific star. And notice that the wise men who are not Jewish that came from the east, they knew that this was the star of Christ. They said, we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So they were waiting. They knew exactly who he was. And they knew that he was going to be king of the Jews. So for those, again, for people who do not think that salvation is for other people other than Israel, you need to continue reading your Bible harder. So let's go to Luke. Luke uh, uh, chronicles these wise men as well, but Luke refers to them as shepherds. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. <coughs> so... I will come back to that. I don't want to jump ahead. And lo, the angel of the Lord. This is Luke 2, uh, verses 8 through 14, for those who are just listening. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of joy, which shall be to all people. Not just Israel, all people. So the first thing we have here is the angel bringing the good news or the gospel, the good tidings of joy, to all non-israelites telling them this is going to be for all people for unto you is born this day in the city of david a savior which is christ the lord <clears throat> now for those of you who missed my ruth study you may want to go back and watch did christ die for all mankind part two uh, we see that the the story of david starts in the book of ruth where she journeys to bethlehem judah to meet Boaz and then through that David is going to be born so it's the city of David um, and this shall be a sign unto you ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger so the angel gives them the location and they tell him exactly where he's going to be in a manger lying in swaddling clothes a manger is where they kept the animals so it's unique that he would be in a manger a baby in a manger in the middle of the night in swaddling clothes they'd be swaddling them because it was very cold outside very likely at night in the area so this right here is a giveaway so they know exactly who he is and everybody else doesn't necessarily know and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising god and saying glory to god in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men all right so let's dig into some of this stuff so matthew refers to them as wise men um here we have the word 3097 in the Strong's Magoi or Magi. Those of you who have heard the um, term Magi before, this is where it comes from. Uh, if you have kids, I'm not sure if they would have seen it, but there's a cartoon called Magi Nation. And it's based around the, 
the mythology of a magi. Uh, the, the reality of magi are different from the, the mythology of the magi. So here we have Matthew referring to them as the magi. So we go here, we see it's 3097, Magus, a magician, an oriental astrologer by implication a magician. Usage, a sorcerer, a magician, a wizard. So this is where we get our word magician, um, magi or magus. If you go down here to help helps word studies, properly belonging to the Magoi, a Midian tribe, a Magian, one of the sacred caste originally Midian, who seem to have conformed to the Persian religion while retaining some of their old beliefs. <clears throat> so here we have a reference to the Medians. Um, we're going to come back to them. And they have conformed to the Persian religion. So in the Bible, you're going to encounter the Medes and the Persians, the law of the Medes and the Persians, mostly in the book of Daniel, also in several of the other prophets. Uh, but today we're going to focus mostly on the, well, mo yeah, mostly on the book of Daniel. So we're going to come back to all these references. Pay attention to all these. Um, mostly in this part right here, Medians and the Persian religion. We're going to come back to all this. So in Luke, he describes them as shepherds. So on the first reading, <coughs> everything seems straightforward. They're shepherds watching their flock by night. But if you dig into the, um, if you dig into the strongs you will see that the word shepherd here 4166 a shepherd hence met of the feeder protector and ruler of a flock of men so that's different they weren't necessarily shepherds in the literal sense of watching over a flock of animals according to this definition now, if we go down here to the helps, someone who the Lord raises up to care for the total well-being of his flock, the people of the Lord. Interesting choice of words, because these are not Israelites, and yet they're referred to as shepherds caring for the people of the Lord. Let's keep going. So flock, I decided to look at flock and flock is interesting because it says a flock, a sheep or goats. Now, see, that sounds contradictory. On one hand, the word used is a reference to a more like a pastor or a spiritual leader for shepherd and then we have the literal reference to goats or sheep but then if you come down to the exhaustive concordance you see it's probably from p-o-i-m-e-n poimen i believe i'm gonna go back and pronounce it so poimen was the word we just looked at p-o-i-m-e-n 4166 so if it comes from this word and this refers to a flock of men or a a um the people of the Lord, a congregation, then it's likely this is a reference to the congregation too. So what we may be looking at with the wise men is that they were in the field that night looking for this star. They were the priests or the, the pastors over their flock of believers. This is what seems to be going on. And I'm going to further back that up as we continue. So we, I said we'd come back to the Medes. So let's look at the Medes. The Medes were an ancient Iranian people. So now we have another clue. They are Iranian people who spoke the Midian language. I mentioned the Midians and who inhabited an area known as Media between Western and Northern Iran. I'm going to pull up a map in a second. So we have the Midians and we have they are Iranian people. So we're going to reference Iran in a second. Um, and then we come down here. We're going to skip all of this. We're going to come down here. A few archaeological sites discovered in the Midian Triangle in Western Iran. So we know we're going to be looking, looking in Iran. They speak, they're Iranian people. Um, they're located in Iran. So we're going to be focusing our attention on Iran geographically and textual sources from contemporary Assyrians and also ancient Greeks in later centuries provide a brief documentation of the history and culture of the Midian state. Apart from a few personal names, the language of the Medes is unknown. The Medes had an ancient Iranian religion, a form of pre-Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrian Mazdaism, or Mithra worshiping, with a priesthood named as Magi. Later, during the reigns of the last Midian kings, the reforms of Zoroaster spread into Western Iran. So this is from Wikipedia. And... We look up the Medes and we see the reference to the Magi. 
we looked up the magi we saw the reference to the Medes, so we we're on the right track the strong's uh references the strong's reference and the wikipedia reference seem to confirm each other that these were median priest or priest from the persian empire or from iran so i decided to google magi and of course we get the wikipedia definition again but it gives us a different part of the wikipedia definition that i hadn't noticed when i first read it it says the magi were um well hold on let me back up so i i googled everything first read from wikipedia and then i ended up coming back to this because for whatever reason i i um, didn't come in through the main magi link on wikipedia so i didn't notice this when i first looked it up so i'm giving you that backstory because i didn't put all that in here so anyway you google magi and this um snippet from wikipedia comes up magi were priests in zoroastrianism so now we see the name zoroastrianism come up again we saw it up here with the medes and the earlier religions of the western iranians so we know we're in the right area the earliest known use of the word magi is in the trilingual inscription written by darius the great known as the behistun inscription so darius the great if that name does not sound familiar to you he is mentioned in several books of the bible but today we're going to be focusing specifically on the book of daniel so darius the great is mentioned in the book of daniel so now we are coming right back into the bible so we we looked at the bible we saw who these people were we see who they're linked to and this leads us right back to a person mentioned in the bible so now we get over to the wikipedia page um magi we saw the description the behestan inscription we're going to talk about that uh we get down to uh let's see here in the gospel of matthew magoi from the east do homage or homage to the newborn jesus and the transliterated plural magi entered english from the latin in context around 1200 this particular use is also commonly rendered in english as kings and more often in recent times as wise men the singular magus appears considerably later and when it is borrowed from the old french in the late 14th century uh, with the meaning magician so now as we read more about them we see that they are sometimes referred to as kings now to understand who the um magi were they were the advisors of the king in most in most cases so they were considered um royal almost so you'd have like uh you'd have the king you'd have the princes and the other nobility and you would have the magi or the the priest class who were also a very high class you guys have seen it um game of thrones and everything else the priest were a high class of people even today in today's society people have this perception of the preacher of the mega church they're living large they got the big house they got the nice car they got all the money and it's not the case for all preachers but that seems to be the perception so same thing with the catholic church the magi were the were the pagan equivalent of that so if you come down uh, um further we get into the iranian sources see we're still at wikipedia looking at the magi now here's what where it gets real real interesting when we start to dig further into this the term only appears twice in iranian text from before the fifth century now pay attention to that so when you get to the when you start to get to bc you count backwards it will start from say 2500 and then go towards one when you get to christ everything starts from one and goes towards 2020 so hopefully you understand how that works uh let's say bc and ad they changed it later on so you take out the reference to christ um but bc is before christ ad is anno domini the year of our lord and so this is fifth century bc so this is coming into about from 600 counting down backwards towards 500 so fifth century bc this is important this one instance occurs in the trilingual behistun inscription of darius the great we read that and which can be dated to about 520 bc bce um bce means before common era and then ce is common era for those that don't know they changed ad to ce and bc to bce to avoid all references to christ <clears throat> in this trilingual text certain rebels have magician as an attribute in the old persian portion as may you generally assume to be the loan word for median again we see that word the meaning of the term in this context is uncertain so uh, and also the Avestan language. This comes from the Avestan language. So a lot of the stuff you're going to hear today is not Hebrew. It's not Greek. It is from the Avestan 
language. So we read this right here. And if we come down to the Greco-Roman sources about the uh, Magi, right here is where it gets real interesting. Uh, let me see. Yeah, I'm not going to read the stuff about Hercules. Better preserved are the descriptions of the mid-5th century BCE Herodotus, who in the portrayal of the Iranian expatriates living in Asia Minor uses the term Magi in two different senses. In the first sense, Herodotus speaks of the Magi as one of the tribes of people, ethnos of the Medes. So again, consistency. In another sense, Herodotus used the term Magi to gen generically refer to the sacerdotal caste, but whose ethnic origins is never again so much as mentioned. So they believed in sacrifices. Um, you're going to see they believe in a Messiah too. We're going to come back to that in a second. According to Robert Charles Zinner, in other accounts, we hear Magi not only in Persia, Parthia, Bactria, Khorasama, Arya, Media, and among the Sakas, but also in non-Iranian lands such as Samaria, Ethiopia, and Egypt. That's important because <coughs> we're going to see later on in the Bible, uh, when we actually do a Bible study on, on Christ, Samaria, the Samaritan woman was already looking for Christ. She knew who he was. The Ethiopians were already familiar with Christ. And we will see later on that the Egyptians are already somewhat familiar with the notion of Christ. Their influence was also spread widespread throughout Asia Minor. It is therefore quite likely that the sacerdotal caste of the Magi was distinct from the Midian tribe of the same name. So the Magi were present all over the world. Well, all over that area. That's important to history and context that the Magi were in these places because as we go through here, you're going to see what the Magi believe and it gets to be quite interesting because people will tell you <clears throat> that everybody else was pagan and that nobody else believed in the most high God um, and that Israelites were the only people who, who really understood and you'll get that from more traditionalists but you'll see as you start to read the Bible such uh, people such as Melchizedek who are not Israelite were considered priests and Abraham paid him tithes. So we'll, we'll come back to some of this stuff. So the Magi were probably Persian Zoroastrians. We saw that name come up, Zoroastrians. So let's talk a little bit about Zoroastrianism. What is it? So Zoro, Zoro, this is from Wikipedia, quick definition, because we're going to get deeper into it. It says Zoroastrianism or Mazda Yasna is one of the world's oldest continually practiced religions. It is a multi-tendency faith centered on a dualistic cosmology of good and evil. Um, yeah, so they believe in God and they believe in an evil power called was well, not called the devil, but he's their equivalent to the devil and an eschatology prophecy for those that don't know predicting the ultimate conquest of evil with theological elements of heathenism uh, monotheism and polytheism ascribed to the teaching of the iranian speaking leader spiritual leader zoroaster also known as zarathustra it exalts an uncreated and benevolent deity of wisdom sounds like similar to god he's uncreated and he's benevolent and he's a deity of wisdom ahura mazda wise lord as its supreme being so they worship a god called ahura mazda and again that is from the Avesta of the avesta language not hebrew not english it's avesta let me see major features of zoroastrianism such as messianism they believe in a messiah judgment after death heaven and hell and free will have may have influenced other religious and philosophical systems including second temple judaism gnosticism greek philosophy christianity islam and the baha'i the baha'i faith and buddhism so they believe that this is one of the oldest practiced religions and it may have influenced all of these other belief systems but today we're going to talk about why that may not be true why it may be true and not true at the same time, actually. So where was Persia? We keep seeing Iran and Persia come up. So I decided to type Persia into Wikipedia and it redirects to Iran. This is modern day Iran. So modern day Iran is ancient Persia. Iran, also called Persia, 
So there we are. And then you guys can read all this if you want to do it later. So now we know the area, the general area these people came from. That it coincides with what the Bible said. We have north, east, south, west. Where did the wise men or magi come from? They came from the east. This is Israel right here. This little sliver. So east would be this way. So the magi or the wise men came from the east, Persia or Iran. They came from here. So what did the people in Persia look like in the past? This is important because I've told you guys many times, if your belief system is based in truth, then everything will remain consistent. <clears throat> and one of the sources, and again, I keep bringing this source up because this source to me is one of the biggest nails in the coffins because it's so verified. It, he, The guy won awards for his contributions to Africa. He was definitely racist. He was definitely a Darwinist. But the Negro in the New World, 1910, uh, held by the Smithsonian Institute, is still reliable when it comes to talking about who was who and what was what. <clears throat> and the reason I do keep going back to this is because if you guys watched the study I did, um, the skin color of God and other answers about race in the Bible, I mentioned that this was one of the the um, the discovery of Susa was one of the most important archaeological discoveries in the last 150 years and the reason this book becomes so important is because he describes what he saw with his own eyes based on his observations uh, from Susa and several other places so this book he he mentions up here for those of you some of you already heard this before but you're gonna hear it again the Elamites of Mesopotamia appear to have been a Negroid people with kinky hair and to have transmitted this racial type to the Jews and Syrians. There is curliness of the hair together with a Negro eye and full lips in the portraiture of Assyria, which conveys the idea of an evident Negro element in Babylonia. All these are important. Babylonia, Assyria, the Jews, the Elamites, quite probably the very ancient Negro invasion of the Mediterranean Europe of which the skeletons of the Alps Maritimes or vestiges came from Syria and Asia Minor on its way to Central and Western Europe. Um, then he gets further down, he gets into the uh, Negroid Jews and the Asiatic Negroid and all that. So, again, this dude is very racist. However, he understands that these people are Negroes. Basically, his summary of his whole book is Negroes are everywhere. They're in Asia. They're in Europe. They're in Africa. They're the Elamites. They're the Jews. They're the Assyrians. And he goes, he goes on and on and on and on throughout the book. Negroes everywhere. He was looking at what might look like Wakanda. So let's talk about the location. So this is Iran, modern day Iran, ancient Persia. This is Israel. Harry Johnston said, the Elamites have Negroid features. Here's Elam, here's Susa. This is where the, the um, discovery took place. This is Elam. This is Sumer and Babylonia. Remember he said that there are elements of the Negro in Babylon, Sumer area. He also said Assyrians. And this is Nineveh. This is Asher. Asher came out of the Kushite empire of Babel. Uh, we went over that and he built Nineveh. So all these people are Negroes, according to Sir Harry Johnston. All of these people are Negroes. So if all of these people are Negroes, we would expect to find more Negroes right next to them, the Medes and the Persians. Now, I want you guys to see that uh, geographically, this is the same place. You see the Persian Gulf right here. This is the Persian Gulf, and then it comes around this bend. You see, the, this is the Persian Gulf comes around this bend. So we're talking about the same area right here, right? This is the Iran area. So all these are Negroes in the area of Iran. Uh, it comes up to here. So all of these are Negroes at least to about right here. And then the Persians, Parthians, and um, Medes are going to be up in this area. So we're going to keep going. So this is, um, here's Susa right here where um, Harry Johnson said these are Negroes right here. This is Susa. This is found on the wall at the walls at Susa, the archers. If you want to reference this in your Bible, look for Shushan Palace, S-H-U-S-H-A-N Palace. And it mentions Shushan Palace. If you look for the Elamites in your Bible, you will find that the Elamites were archers. So these are part of the um, immortal guard, which you see in the movie 300, the immortals. Um, the archers were Elamites. 
And as you can see, they're depicted with kinky hair, just as Harry Johnson said. Um, you can't really see their lips uh, too closely in this picture, but they have black skin. So this corroborates what he said. They have Negroid features. This was found at Nineveh. For those who did the study with me, um, this was these are Assyrians and these are Judeans. The Judeans or Jews, Yehuda, Jews, they have kinky hair and thick lips, Negroid features. Same thing with the Assyrians. Kinky hair, thick lips, Negroid features. So this all corroborates what Harry Johnston said. So consistency is key. I keep saying that consistency is the key. So if we look around, <coughs> if we look around Persia, we find a place called Persepolis. So we see the address, Iran, Iran is Persia, founded in the sixth century BC. Remember I said those dates are important. Uh, sixth century is gonna be um, the late 600, or let's see, like 699, 700 going through 600. And then we're gonna get into the fifth century, which is uh, 600 going down to 500. So we're gonna keep, everything we find is gonna end up in the sixth and fit late fifths or early fifth centuries, I guess you would say it that way. Um, this is what we're gonna keep encountering throughout this journey. So Persepolis founded in the sixth century BC, you would expect if Harry Johnston said, hey, all these are Negroes over here, and we find that they are indeed Negroes, like he said, it would remain consistent. So in Persepolis, in Iran, aka Persia, we find a statue of Darius the Great in Persepolis. And he has black skin, he has kinky hair, Negroid features. In the Bible, he's referred to as Darius the Mede, and sometimes he's referred to as Darius the Persian. But the Medes and the Persians uh, were a combined empire. They, they were together. So <clears throat> we see some consistency. We find another Negro in the area who is of the Medes and Persians. If we keep looking, we see the Persian guard at Persepolis and we see they have kinky hair and Negroid lips and black skin, Negroid features. So we see consistency, excuse the watermark, but these were the best pictures I could find um, that actually gave you guys a close up uh, to see what they look like. And for some reason, they don't have any of these without any watermarks, I'm not sure why. But anyway, um, so you guys see what these people look like. These are Persians. Uh, 300 did a somewhat decent job of it by making the Persians darker skinned. But as we can see, the Persians were definitely dark people. So why would Zoroastrian priest be searching for a Jewish Messiah? That's the that's the question in my mind that did not make sense. If they were Zoroastrians and they were from the Median Medo-Persian Empire and they were uh, shepherds over their flock of people, why would they be looking for a Jewish Messiah to worship? So let's go back to the book of Daniel since Darius is mentioned. Let's go to where Darius is mentioned in the book of Daniel. And what's going to happen is there's a Belshazzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's, uh, was this, this, not Nebuchadnezzar's son. I believe uh, Belshazzar was the son of Nabonidus. Uh, but anyway, Belshazzar is throwing this party. And this is the writing on the wall, um, the hand writing on the wall uh, uh, story. So we're going to start from Daniel chapter 5, verses 8 through 12. Then came in all the king's wise men. There's that word again. It's different because it's uh, in the book of Daniel. Daniel was written in part Hebrew, part Aramaic, and then the New Testament is going to be written in mostly Greek. So then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. Remember, I told you before, the priest class would be the consultants of the king. Uh, so the king would consult them. Yeah. And let's see, verse 10. Now the queen, by reasons of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. That's a greeting you're going to hear again and again. That's the greeting of the Medes and the Persians. O king, live, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom. Remember we said the wisdom, they worship the God of wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, 
All right, let me read that again. There's a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, I say thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Remember before I mentioned that the word magi came to include all of them. The magi were the Mede and Medo-Persian priest class. Who did the king call? All the wise men. Who came to visit Christ? The wise men, the Medo-Persian wise men. So we're talking about the same group here. Who was over them? Daniel. Why? Because Nebuchadnezzar set Daniel over all the wise men in Babylon. The magicians, the or the magi, or the maguses, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel who the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will show thee the interpretation. So now we ended up back at Darius. That led us back to the book of Daniel, which led us back to the story of Nebuchadnezzar, putting him in charge of all the Magi in Babel or in, in the in the empire. Because uh, the Medo-Persian Empire is going to come take over. Well, they've taken over at this point. Well, they're about to take over. Let me let me not get ahead of myself. So this is where they're about to take over. The handwriting on the wall. That was verse 12. When we jump down to verses 24 through 31, here's what we see. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and his writing was written. And this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, up farsin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. He's talking to Belshazzar. Tekel. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Paris, or Upfarsin, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. <coughs> so now the Medes and the Persians are going to come in. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be thir the third ruler in the kingdom. So Daniel just got a promotion, but it's not going to matter right now. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius the Mede took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. So Darius the Mede, or Darius the Great, takes the kingdom. He's 62 years old. Now, to the right, you see a, um, a sphinx that was found at Susa. Remember, I told you Susa was one of the, this is believed to be one of the greatest discoveries in the last 150 years. <coughs> Archaeological discovery, excuse me. And we see that Darius the Great is depicted as a black man or the sphinx is supposed to look like Darius the Great because it's depicted as black and we see the afro so let's keep looking <coughs> could Daniel and Zoroaster be the same person so we're going to talk about Zoroaster in a second but one of the things that I covered was the fact that Zoroastrianism was a monotheistic religion in the middle of a polytheistic world and there weren't many of those. You had Judaism, and I don't believe there were too many others. You had Zor Judaism and Zoroastrianism. So this Zoroaster, who was over the Magi, um, he established the monotheistic religion for the Magi. So I started to wonder if it was possible that Daniel and Zoroaster could possibly be the same person. So let's look into that. So the first thing I did was when was when did Daniel the prophet live? And this is on Google. Just Google it. Daniel was a righteous man of princely lineage and lived about 620 to 538 BC. He was carried off to Babylon in 605 BC by Nebuchadnezzar the Assyrian, but was still living when Assyria was overthrown by the Medes and the Persians. Okay, so 538 BC. So Daniel is living in the sixth century. Now, notice the, I had to blow my nose real quick. Um, notice that it says about, this is a, um, this is a estimate. It's not an exact date, 620 to 538. So I said, okay, well, let me look and see when Zoroaster lived. So I Googled it. When did Zoroaster live? Zoroaster spelled, also spelled Zarathustra, Greek Zoroaster. We covered that before. Born traditionally circa, this was the C means, 628 BC. Daniel lived about 620. So the estimate is within eight years of each other, but both of them are not sure on the exact date. His death is estimated circa 551 BCE. Daniel's death was 538 circa. 
So this is a 13 year difference. And again, they're estimating. So they did live in the same exact time period. Zoroaster is associated with the Magi. And we see in the book of Daniel that Daniel was placed over the Magi. We saw earlier that around 600 BC is when Zoroastrianism took off. So we're going to see some other reasons that Zoroastrianism may be linked to Daniel and may have taken off around that same time. So again, these are just estimate dates. But if you're looking at it from a historical perspective, the Hebrew Bible, and then this is from Britannica.com, Encyclopedia Britannica, Zoroaster was a Medo-Persian um, priest. It seems to be more than coincidence, in my opinion, that their births and deaths would coincide around the same time. It seems more than coincidence coincidence that Zoroaster was over the Magi around the same time the Bible says Daniel was placed over the Magi. So there's either a contradiction historically or they are probably one and the same person or a third option is Zoroaster may have been an apprentice to Daniel. So we'll keep going. So the book of Daniel is written in the 6th century. So everything remains cons consistent. It's written in the 6th century. It says 606 um, BC around there. So if Daniel was alive in 620, the countdown, you would go from 620 to 538. So we see that the date, again, all these are circa estimates. We see that the date fits for the book of Daniel's writing. We see that the date fits for both of them existing at the same time. So then we come back to Zoroastrianism. I came back right here um, with the possible roots dating back to the second millennium BC. Um, enters recorded history in the 5th century and here we'll keep reading it says it served as the state religion and ancient of the ancient Iranian empires for more than a millennium from around 600 BC to 650 CE or AD um, so now the dates match the Zoroastrianism sparks up around the same time Daniel's alive the same time Zoroaster's alive the same time the um, the Bible says Daniel was in charge of the Magi and all the the soothsayers and the other people and same thing Zoroaster at the same time was said to be in charge of these people <coughs> excuse me so if Daniel and Zoroaster are the same person would it have been possible for Daniel to have made Zoroastrianism the state religion. And remember, we're talking about the Avesta language. We're not talking about English or Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic or the languages we're usually familiar with. Zoroastrianism is an Avesta word. So is it possible that Daniel could have made Zoroastrianism the state religion? So in Daniel chapter 6, verse 1 through 5, we see that it was 100% possible for Daniel to have done it. It pleased Darius or Darius to set up to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom and over these three presidents. So they had 120 princes and over the 20 over the over the 120 princes. You have three presidents of whom Daniel was the first that the princes might give accounts unto them and the kings should ha uh, the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was found in him and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. So he's already over the Magi. And remember, Belshazzar had, had appointed him third in the kingdom, but that didn't matter because Darius the Great came in and he saw Daniel say, you know what? I'm going to put you over everything. It says, then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Remember, these people are pagans. They, they worship multiple gods. Daniel worships one God. Now, this is this is why I say I believe Daniel could possibly be Zoroaster, because Zoroaster established monotheism in the midst of a polytheistic um. I guess a polytheistic um, kingdom. So now we have Daniel here. We, we know Daniel worships one God. These other men do not. These other men do not. So how was Zoroaster depicted? Zoroaster was the prophet of Zoroastrianism. What was Daniel? Daniel's also a prophet. Again, we see another parallel. So on the right and left, so ignore the left picture. The left is a, a depiction of 
a Jewish priest, but without the breastplate. And Zoroaster was not a high priest. He was the head priest, but he was not like a Jewish high priest. And this guy is not a Jewish high priest. High priest, but notice the similarity in the in the way they dress. Just the similarities in the way they dress. So, what? Again, ignore the skin color because we're gonna come back to that. Now, we we all know that history has been whitewashed to reflect the views of the oppressor. So people who were other colors get turned white. So pay no attention to that part. <coughs> But pay attention to the fact that he is dressed similar to a Hebrew. He is a prophet. He worships one God. He lives in the middle. He's a he is a major um, priest in the Medo-Persian Empire, and apparently he had the power to establish monotheism as a religion, which we see that Daniel would have had had he been over the kingdom. <coughs> but. In my opinion, Daniel didn't have to do it because what we're going to see in a second, I don't want to get ahead of myself. <laughs> let me get let me get back to that in a second. So we have Jesus versus Zoroaster. This is a good video you guys should go check out, uh, Inspiring Philosophy. This breaks down uh, Jesus and Zoroaster because there are some people that try to make parallels between Zoroaster and Jesus, and it does not fit. However, some of the parallels do fit the actions and activities of a prophet, not a messiah. So those that try to force it to fit, this breaks it down real good and it gives you the truth. It tells you which which um, myths are true and confirmed and which ones are not verified at all. And most of the ones that try to make him out to be the Messiah are not verified, but all the stuff associated with being a prophet, most of that is verified. So check out that video if you wanna see Zer uh, Jesus versus Zoroaster. So anyway, I kept reading and I found this. And this is interesting because it makes another reference. Uh, remember, Ahura Mazda is called the God of Wisdom. <coughs> and he's worshipped as the supreme being. There was a time when the philosophy of oneness, one entity and one universal power emerged out of the polytheistic teachings. So that's consistent with what we've seen. The Persian word, I'm not going to try to pronounce these, meaning good words, good thoughts and good deeds became the main keystones of the religion called Zoroastrianism. It is known as history's oldest monotheistic religion and was founded by a man who became a prophet and who who also was the first philosopher in history. His name was Zarathustra. These ideas were sprung out of the place where Zarathustra lived, which is considered to be modern day northeastern Iran, in which in ancient times were one of the main geographical sites where the Aryan civilization thrived. Um, we're going to come back to the Aryan civilization because they don't actually show up till later. We're talking about 500 BC ish, 600, 500 BC ish. So they're not there yet. The Aryans come later into the area, which is why you're going to see Iranians or Persians that start to be this color. Because <coughs> as we already saw in Persepolis, we uncovered black Persians. So a philosopher, let's just look up the definition of what a philosopher is. And so I just Googled this. And this is from Oxford and this is from Wikipedia. A person engaged or learned in a philosophy, especially as an academic discipline. What was Daniel doing? Daniel was set over all these smart people, the wise men, the philosophers, the soothsayers, the magicians, all of them. A philosopher over here, Wikipedia definition. A philosopher is someone who practices philosophy. The term philosopher comes from the ancient Greek, meaning lover of wisdom. The coining of the term has, term has been attributed to the Greek thinker Pythagoras. So he lover of wisdom. What did they say was found in Daniel? The wisdom of the gods. They mentioned wisdom three times in Daniel. Um, well, a couple more, but they mentioned in Daniel chapter 5. They said the wisdom of the gods is found in him. But in Daniel chapter 117, it says, As for these four children, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions. Daniel 2.14, that Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. Daniel 2.20, Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever for wisdom and might are his. And then we also see that Solomon asked God for wisdom. So there's this continual theme of God being associated with wisdom throughout the Bible. And I also find it interesting that Ahura Mazda, 
the main god of the Medes or of the Zoroastrians is uh, literally means God of wisdom or Lord of wisdom. And we saw that Darius the Great or Darius the Great worshipped the God of wisdom. And we also seen that Daniel was his favorite person uh, as far as the princes go. And Daniel was over all of them. So it is consistent that Daniel may have had influence over Darius the Great. And if Daniel was monotheistic, it makes sense that Darius the Great would be monotheistic and worship the God, the one, one God, all powerful, supreme creator like he did. So, again, this is not concrete. This is just tying the evidence together. So could Zoroastrians have been familiar with the book of Micah? Now, the reason the book of Micah comes up is because of what happens when they visit Herod. The Magi seem to have been expecting Christ. Remember, they came to worship. They were in the field with their followers. They were in the field worshiping, and they said they saw his star. So they knew it was the Messiah's star. The angels appeared to them in the field and told them exactly what he'd be wearing and where he'd be located at. So we see that all this is consistent. Let's go back to Matthew uh, 2, uh, verses 1 through... Uh, you know, we won't go all the way back there. We'll go uh, Matthew 2, verse... Six it says, and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people. This is a quote from the book of Micah. Um, let me see Micah chapter five, verse two. But thou Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me. That is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been been from old, from everlasting. So. An eternal being was going to be born into the tribe of Judah. This is the belief. An eternal being, the Messiah, who had, like you said, for goings forth had been from old, from everlasting. He was an eternal being being born unto mankind. The Zoroastrians believe something similar would happen. Why? Again, we see a consistency here. And we're going to we're going to keep going. But Zoroastrians, I, I read it earlier, they believed in a Messiah. They were a they believed in one God and they believed in a Messiah that would be born. We see that reflected because they show up to worship the Messiah, the king of Israel. So we know that's consistent. So it seems that they were aware of the book of Micah. But how would they be aware of the book of Micah? So I Googled when was the book of Micah written? We see it was written during the 8th century, which was about 200 years before Daniel. So Daniel would have been familiar with the book of Micah. So if Daniel was over the Magi, and Daniel was familiar with the book of Micah, and Daniel, were, Daniel was teaching these people about the prophecies and about Christ and about um, well the coming Messiah and about the Most High God, they saw him praying in his um, room all the time. They had the other three Hebrew boys there. It makes sense that if Daniel and Zoroaster are the same person that they would that Daniel would teach them about the one creator the all powerful uh creator that's eternal and a god of wisdom he would teach them about a messiah that was coming from the tribe of Judah he would teach them all of this stuff it it makes sense when you start to tie it together so now we understand a possible reason why Zoroastrian priests were already there with their congregation waiting to worship the Messiah. But the question is, how would this belief system sustain for that long? Because Daniel was born in 6th century BC. And this event took place probably around 1 AD. So this, this um, belief system had to have lasted 600 years. Now, what we will learn later on, if you watch that video as well, that Zoroastrianism was an oral belief system. It was not written until around 900 AD. So about 1500 years after Daniel lived and Zoroastrianism was established, then they started to write it. But you will see that they started to make up stories about the prophet. They started to add stuff to the belief system. So it was no longer what it was before. So let's keep going. So who did Zoroastrians worship as God? I, I mentioned before, Ahura Mazda. They worshiped Ahura Mazda, the Lord of Wisdom. He was believed to be the creator. Again, they believed in a Messiah. They believed in heaven and hell. They believed in judgment after death. They even believed in a second coming. 
So let's keep going. Ahura Mazda. Now I'm going to read some of this right here. Also known as all these names is the creator and highest deity of Zoroastrianism. Ahura Mazda is the first and most frequently invoked spirit in the Yasna. The literal meaning of the word is Ahura is Lord and that of Mazda is wisdom. Ahura Mazda first appeared in the Achmanid period 550 to 330 BC under Darius's Behistun inscription. So this is an estimate. Five, circa 550, right? That falls right in line with when we said Daniel lived. That falls right in line when we said um, Zoroaster lived. And again, he's found in Darius's Behestan inscription. So let's read his Behestan inscript, inscription. And this is not all of it. This is just some of it. Now notice how he refers to Ahura Mazda in this, which is interesting. King Darius or Darius says, that is why we were called Achaemenids. From antiquity, we have been noble. From antiquity has our dynasty been royal. King Darius says, eight of my dynasty were kings before me, and I am the ninth. Nine in succession, we have been kings. King Darius says, by the grace of Ahura Mazda, am I king. Ahura Mazda has granted me the kingdom. So he gives credit to the God of wisdom. He says, grace came from the God of wisdom. This creator, this almighty being that he worships. And remember, Daniel is his favorite guy. And Daniel is monotheistic. And Daniel worships the all-powerful creator. The God that gave wisdom to Solomon. The God that gave wisdom to him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The God that they keep saying put wisdom in Daniel. That's the pagans say. So it talks about the territories. And once again, he says, these are the countries that are subject unto me by the grace of Ahura Mazda. So... <clears throat> we see this continuous theme. He gives credit to Ahura Mazda for giving him the kingdom. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar didn't give grace to God for giving him the kingdom at first. So could Ahura Mazda be another name for the Most High God? <coughs> so Ahura Mazda, this comes from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Supreme God in ancient Iranian religion, especially Zoroastrianism, the religious system of the Iranian prophet Zoro, Zarathustra, 6th century BC. Again, consistent. Ahura Mazda was worshipped by the Persian king Darius and his successors as the greatest of all gods, protector of the just king. So he is the god of gods, king of kings, lord of lords. This is who they're worshipping in 500 BC under the Medo-Persian Empire. <coughs> Excuse me. So... I'm not sure why I wrote the king, the decree of uh, Cyrus. This is supposed to be the decree of uh, Darius. So I do have to. So just um, scratch that right there. I'm not sure why I wrote Cyrus, but Darius uh, made this decree. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any God or man within 30 days, save thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? So let me preface this before we continue. Remember the king, the, the priest, the I'm sorry, the princes, they hated Daniel because Daniel was going to be above them. And they couldn't find occasion against him except for with his God. So they tricked Darius or Darius into uh, creating a law. That said nobody could worship or ask petition of anybody else but him, man or God. <clears throat> because they wanted Daniel tossed into the lion's den. Which they succeeded in having him tossed into the lion's den. So this is where it's coming from. Petition of any God or man within 30 days, save for thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. The king answered and said, this thing is true. The thing is true according to the laws, and the Me laws of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Now we're going to see. <coughs> Excuse me. This is important because... Once the king passes the law, not even the king may change that law. Um, this will give you some perspective on what's going on in the book of Esther when um, Haman gets the king to agree to allow people to kill Jews. And Esther goes back in there and convinces the king that this thing is wrong. And so he can't change the law that people could kill Jews on those days. So he writes a new law into effect that says the Jews can defend themselves and kill anybody that comes after them. If you have not heard my um, study on the first purge, you can go find that in the in the um, on my channel. The first purge, I think it's parts one. It might be part. It might be two parts, but I know it's at least one part. 
but that breaks down those events. So the law of the Medes and Persians cannot change. So they tricked Darius or Darius into making this law that he has to throw Daniel to the lion's den. Then answered, this is uh, chapter six, verse 13. Then answered they and said before the king that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. So after they uh, made the decree, after the king signed in law, Daniel went to his uh, room, opened his window, faced Jerusalem and play, prayed three times a day in front of everybody. Then the king when he had heard these words was sore displeased with himself so he was mad that he got tricked and set his heart on daniel to deliver him and he labored to the going down of the sun to deliver him so now the king who has made this law the king can't even change this law so he's trying to find a loophole and he's trying to find a way to deliver daniel from his law that he's been tricked into making so remember the king likes daniel Darius or Darius likes Daniel and it says these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king know O king that the law of the Medes and the Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king establishes may be changed so he cannot change this he can only come up with rules or loopholes to circumvent certain things and we're going to see just like um well that happened to Esther here Darius or Darius cannot circumvent this so Daniel gets tossed into the lion's den and the first thing he does the first thing in the morning he runs and sees if Daniel he tells Daniel I know your God can deliver you he had faith in Daniel's God he says I know your God can deliver you so first thing he does is he runs to the um, lion's den in the morning he said uh, he asked him was your God able to deliver you and he said then said Daniel unto the king O king live forever my God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth and they have hurt have not hurt me for as much as before him innocency was found in me and also before thee O king have I done no hurt then was the king exceeding glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den so Daniel was taken up out of the den and no matter of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God and the king commanded and they brought those men which had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children and their wives, the lion and the lions had mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den. So now these people are dead. Daniel is left standing. And here's what happens. Remember, the law of the Medes and the Persians cannot be changed. And whatever the king establishes cannot be changed. So here's where you're going to get your answer of why Zo uh, Medo-Persian Zoroastrian priest showed up to look for a Jewish Messiah and also worshipped one God from 500 BC on until uh, Islam took over. So it says, Then the king wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree, so here's the decree, that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and the fear of the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed in his dominion shall be even unto the end. So Nebuchadnezzar understands exactly who's Dan who Daniel's God is. He said, Daniel, I know your God can deliver you from this. And the first thing he asked him, did your God spare you? Daniel says yes then he makes a decree that everybody basically worships Daniel's God you fear Daniel's God his kingdom is going to be forever so now now that we understand that Darius has made this decree it cannot be changed so now they are forced into acknowledging Daniel's God so we see Darius worshiping one God that he calls the God of wisdom Ahura Mazda and we see that Daniel worships one God that he says gave him wisdom. We know he gave Solomon wisdom. So wisdom comes over and over and over again. If you read the book of Proverbs, it's all about wisdom. So this decree explains why the um, Zoroastrian priests were in the area looking for a Jewish Messiah, possibly. So what did Ahura Mazda look like? And this is one of the places we come to an inconsistency in research. So now we see a white deity in the middle of Negroid territory. <coughs> Excuse me. So remember, everybody looked like Negroids in the area. Negroes. Everybody had Negroid features in the area. So it's inconsistent that they would worship a white god. But why else is it inconsistent that they would worship a white god? 
because Daniel himself describes uh, what many people believe to be a pre-incarnate Christ. And I'm gonna tell you why this is important to understanding. So Daniel 10 verse six, he said, his body was like a barrel and his face as the appearance of lightning and his eyes like lamps of fire and his arms and his feet were the color of polished brass or bronze as we studied um, in the skin color of God and other uh, answers about race in the Bible. If you haven't seen that video, go watch it. And the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. So we have skin color, uh, the barrel. We're going to talk about that in a second. We talked about it in there too, but we have this skin color, bronze. Bronze versus white God. So Daniel describes his God as white. Nebuchadnezzar is worshiping Ahura Mazda, who he says is a supreme being. But Daniel, Daniel has a bronze colored God and it seems that Darius has a white God. That is inconsistent if Daniel Zoroaster and Ahura Mazda is the most high or, or a reference to the most high in the Avesta language. But also we, uh, not even but, also we have the revelation uh, description from John. We're causing a Jasper and a Sardine. So we looked at the Jasper Brown, Rainbow, and then Rainbow Jasper and the Sardine Stone. If you want these, if you want this study in its entirety, go look at Sky. Uh, God's skin color and other answers about race in the Bible. So we have an inconsistency here. Over and over again in the Bible, we keep seeing brown used as a description, and yet we found a white God. So I kept digging because, again, if there's an inconsistency, it needs to be um, addressed because I personally change my belief to fit the evidence. I don't change the evidence to fit what I believe. So in that study, we compared all the, the colors we were given. The yellow jasper, which has copperish tones. The jasper, which is brownish. or um, And the rainbow jasper, which again is brownish. And then the sardine stone. And then we have bronze. So all these various shades of brown point to a creator of color. So if my theory is correct, I fully expect to find... Zoroaster depicted in a different way because as we can see this is actually a retouched or a touched up painting or the colors were touched up this is not the original so I decided to keep looking <clears throat> and once again we find that history has whitewashed Ahura Mazda that's what I meant not Zoroaster Ahura Mazda uh, a second ago when I said they whitewashed Zoroaster. They whitewashed Zoroaster too, but they whitewashed Ahura Mazda. We can see he has kinky hair like a Negro. He has the lips like a Negro. He has Negroid features. So now we have consistency. If Daniel described his God as bronze and all these other color stones and John did, and we saw what um, Darius looked like, how he was painted. And we see the area. So it makes sense to me now that they would worship a all-powerful God that looked like this versus one that looked like a white man. Now, we're not going to get into all what this is. Uh, Ancient Aliens talks about this. For those of you who actually watch Ancient Aliens, I do not believe that they are even remotely correct on what's going on here. I believe this has to do with the throne of God. Uh, we get into Ezekiel's wheels, the seraphim, not the seraphim and the cherubim were on the throne. It's a lot of stuff going on in this picture. And maybe if I do a study on Ezekiel's wheels, we'll come back to Ahura Mazda. But for now, I just want you to pay attention to the features, the Negroid hair, the kinky hair. This is, this is who they worship as the creator, the all-powerful, the god of wisdom. Somebody who looks like a Negro with kinky hair. Where else do we find this? All throughout the Bible. So why does any of this matter? So it matters because it shows consistency throughout history. So if Ahura Mazda is the most high, just uh, to the Medo-Persians, the Medo -Persians, what they called them in the Avesta language, if, again, if they are one and the same, it would make sense that if Christ was born, they would um, he would pick somebody who looked close to him. And here we see a Negro with kinky hair. This is Christ's grandfather, according to the depiction. And this is his grandmother, Anna. Uh, Saint Joachim is his grandfather. Saint Anna is his grandmother. 
and we see they are Negroes. So then this is the oldest depiction of Christ. Doesn't mean it's actually him. It doesn't mean it's spot on. But if if the kinky hair is right, this is like an afro and dark skin. All this is consistent. What did Christ say? If you've seen the Father, now let me quote it right here, John 14, 9. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then show us the Father? <coughs> so ask yourself, is this consistent? Did the Father have kinky hair and dark skin? Well, we saw... We can actually see some of the paint still on here, but he has kinky hair for sure. He's in a part of the world that's inhabited by Negroes. He is, uh, well, let me back up. Daniel, who is closely associated with this, as it looks based on the time, the area, and everything else, Daniel describes him as having bronze-colored skin. So all of this is consistent. He said, he who has seen the Father has seen me. So again, even if this is not 100% spot on accurate, it is a general uh, description, or it's generally accurate of we, what we would expect to find. If Christ was black, we should expect to find worship of a black, all powerful creator, which we do twice. We find it in the Bible and we find it in Zoroastrianism, which is linked directly back to the Bible, directly to Daniel the prophet. So let's, let's go ahead and see if everything is consistent so you have who may be again maybe and i want to issue that disclaimer i'm not saying hey this is the most high god now let me also put this out here i do not believe daniel would have commissioned an image of the most high god because it violates the commandments so i believe this may have been done without daniel's permission or after daniel was dead that they created this image based on Daniel's description out of the book of Revelation. Because remember, and I'm sorry, not Revelation, out of the book of Daniel. In the book of Revelation, John adds that he had hair like wool. So this is another feature that gets added later that we don't even see in the book of Daniel is hair like wool. So in my opinion, this is probably, Daniel probably gave them more details than we had in the Bible. Because remember, Daniel was told to stop writing and shut up the book. But then John comes along and he has a little bit more detail than we have. And John's details also match Uhura Mazda. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying, let me also throw this out there. Excuse me. Let me also throw this out there. Now, I'm not telling you to go worship Uhura Mazda. And I'm not telling you to become a Zoroastrian or any of that other stuff. I'm just showing you the parallels of other parts and cultures and history that tend to come back and help us established uh, more validity to the Bible if I guess if you want to say it that way um, I'm not gonna get caught into the semantics of how to say that but basically they verify a lot of the stuff that's going on in the Bible <coughs> so he said if you've seen me you've seen the father so again if this is a generally right description and Christ was black with an afro we see Ahura Mazda with an afro and he was very likely black based on the region and based on the people so if you've seen the father you've seen me these two pictures become consistent with each other. But what do we see in the book of Genesis? We see that he says, let us make man in our image. So if you've seen the son and you've seen the father and they look like this, and if man was made in his image or their image, it makes sense why Darius the Great is depicted like this. We see parallels. We see the Persians depicted like this. Let us make man in our image. We see the Elamites depicted like this. We see the Assyrians depicted like this. And we see the Jews or Judeans depicted like this. Let us make man in our image. So if we start really digging through history, we can find even more consistencies out that, that support our belief in a black Messiah, support our belief in, that uh, the Most High God was black or bronze or all these other colors described as i don't think that any of these colors are spot on because when you're trying to just use physical um physical things to describe spiritual matters it, it's more like a um i guess a, a general description or as close as they could possibly get uh, to the description i don't believe these are literal the exact colors just close so again 
you find consistency in scripture you find consistency in history when you start digging and a lot of this stuff has been hidden from us for a reason and that is because they did not want us to wake up and get to the point we are now and really confirm and establish exactly who we are as Israel confirm and establish who the most high is and excuse me that we are a chosen people we are a chosen nation and the most high looks like us we have a kinsman redeemer i talked about the kinsman redeemer the the um the idea of a kinsman redeemer so for those of you who have not yet grabbed your copy of undeniable full color evidence of is black israelites in the bible make sure you do so it is kryptonite for those that doubt that we are the people and if you want the full-on history check out the black hebrew awakening the final 400 years as slaves in america if you have not yet subscribed click the subscription button also click the thumbs up button uh please share the video and if you don't want to miss any future studies make sure you click the notification bell and then turn on all notifications so hope you guys enjoyed leave me some feedback um drop your comments and until next time i'm out